Okay. Well, so hello everyone. Welcome to the compiler lecture series, episode two. We got Dan Goman here to talk about crane lift, uh, and I'll let him take it away. All right. Thanks, Nico. So I'm Dan Goman. I'm going to talk about uh, crane lift stuff. And if anyone has any questions as we go along, um, feel free to ping me or um, or Nico either online or uh, here in the video. Um, so crane lift, uh, just a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. I'm going to talk briefly what crane lift is. Um, we'll go through some topics about crane lift IR and what kind of things we're doing with it and why we think it's designed well. And talk about optimization, stuff that we're doing now and stuff that we want to do in the future and, and stuff that, that people using crane lift can do before they start using crane lift. So jumping into it, what is crane lift? Crane lift is a compiler cogen backend. That's sort of the core of the system. That's what a lot of the stuff we pulled around. And so we organize this as a series of crates. Um, the, the central crate is the crane lift cogen crate. And at its core, it's conceptually a uh, function in terms of mathematical sense, where the input is, uh, first of all, IR, intermediate representation, for a function. It's a big data structure that represents a whole uh, function of code. Um, a target description, which is basically a machine like x86, um, and a description of what that is, um, as well as, as compilation settings, um, optimization level, um, and other things like that. The output of this function is, uh, first of all, machine code, which is just an array of bytes. It's, it's bytes that if you present it to your CPU, it can execute them. Um, and also metadata to describe those bytes. Metadata that can describe things like which instructions are, are expected to trap, uh, which instructions reference symbolic addresses that need to be relocated, um, and other properties of digit journey code, uh, like debug info can also be in there. Um, along with crane the code gen, we have a bunch of other crates that sort of uh, augment it and provide extra functionality. Crane the front end is a crate that helps uh, in producing crane the IR and in building up this data structure to hand off to the code generator. Uh, crane the WASM is a crate that is uh, that can translate WASM code into crane the IR. Um, WASM being WebAssembly. Um, crane the ferry is a, uh, a system for generating native object files, .o files, uh, with crane the code generated in them, so you can, you can create native code. Um, and we also have a crane lift simple JIT. Um, there are many ways to use crane lift, uh, including using the JIT. You don't have to use simple JIT, but simple JIT is sort of a simple framework that ties a lot of things together and provides a lot of services for you to just run the code that crane, crane lift generates in memory uh, by making it executable and running it directly. So this is just a brief overview of some of the major crates. Um, there are more, but this is just kind of a way to get started. Uh, now I want to dive in a little bit about uh, crane lift IR. So crane lift IR is the central uh, data structure that the code generator uses and that a lot of the system is kind of organized around. Um, it's, a, it's an in-memory data structure, but of course we also have a textual representation of it and we can go back and forth in two. Uh, here's a, a really brief screenshot of, of some IR, um, just kind of give you a flavor of what's going on. Um, basically the, 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 the main unit of the, of the IR is the function. So we have a function, uh, crane lift decide to operate on a single function at a time. So that you can compile functions in parallel with different instances of crane lift. Uh, but, so mostly crane lift can just focus on like I have my one function and that's my universe. Everything is in that. Um, inside the function, there is a sequence of we start with a sequence of declarations. Um, I guess in this code here, there's just a SS00 is a stack slot. Um, and then there's a series of, of basic blocks. Uh, EPBs stands for extended basic block, and I'll talk about what that is a little later. Um, and then within each basic block is just a series of instructions. And the instructions are typically doing things like arithmetic or accessing memory, um, or branching to other basic blocks. It, it looks like the uh, local variables, so to speak, are, are local to basic blocks. Is that true? I see they take um, parameters. It's sort of like they, SSA, but even more refined. Yeah, they, they do. Um, the, the variables, um, if, if one block dominates another block, then the variable could be seen in another block. So they are visible across block boundaries as long as there's a dominance relationship between them two. So v2 in this code example is defined in EBB1. Um, I guess there's no uses of it here, but um, it, it could be used in EBB2 because EBB2 is dominated by EBB1 uh, in this example. So the, the parameters for blocks uh, come in when, when a block, when, when you're not dominated, uh, when the use is not dominated by the def. So you have potentially multiple different uh, values that want to get used um, and this is, so this is getting into the SSA form a little bit. Um, in order to preserve SSA form, every variable can have a single def. But if you have something like an if else, where uh, in the source code, you assign a different value in the if and the else, um, 
uh, typical to SSA form would use a fee node to merge the two together at the merge point into a single def for the merge. Um, Prelift uses a, a concept called block parameters, which is basically the same thing as fee nodes. It just looks a little bit different than they are. It just looks like the blocks have, have parameters. You can almost think of the blocks as being little functions that you can call. Um, it's it's a, a, along, the, along the lines of, of a CPS kind of system where basic blocks are basically functions, although we don't go to full CPS to do that. Some of the big ideas we have, um, as I say, form is the central concept. And we, we actually make this, uh, uh, we rely on this in, in all aspects. We, we take SSIA form and we preserve it all the way through code generator. We do wedge location in SSA form. And so that's that's a very central idea. Um, and, and along with that, we use one IR through a code generator. Instead of switching between uh, a mid level optimizer IR and a code generator IR, we just use one that, that is suitable for using uh, all the way through structure selection and wedge location. Um, we don't have pointer types. Um, because Cranelift IR is focused on being a code generator, um, it's not doing things like pointer analysis. Um, and so it doesn't have any kind of use for, for actual pointer types or any kind of knowledge of, of, of higher level uh, concept of memory ordering, um, or memory layouts. Um, and so instead of pointer types, we just have integer types. Uh, this also means that we don't have a Gettleman pointer instruction. There's just integer instructions. This simplifies things for the code generator because um, at a hardware level, Pointers are just integers on most modern architectures, so they'll use the same registers and the same instructions. So it's actually simplifies things. We just have, we just say that they are. They're just integers at this level. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about later about like what if we wanted to do memory optimizations and, and pointer optimizations, what would we need to do on top of this? Um, another of our big ideas is we want to minimize minimize the memory usage, especially for the very common case of just generating code quickly. Um, and so we don't have built-in death use lists. Um, uh, in, in, for example, LVM, there's, it maintains a linked list for every use of a value um, automatically. So whenever you create a value or, or add an operand, um, these linked lists of, of how all the values that are being used, uh, all the places that are values being used is maintained automatically. And uh, Creative doesn't maintain that. It's just an extra data structure that um, is not always needed. And so we just take care to not need one. And so we can save memory and save the extra complexity of having those around. Um, we also don't have arbitrary sized integers like LVM does, so there's no I77 type. Um, and this, again, is sort of a bias towards a code generator focus. Hardware don't necessarily, most hardware platforms don't have integer types like I77. We just have the standard, standard um, I8, I16, I32, I64. Um, and so CreateNets is really focused on those types with the expectation at this point of if people want to use other sized integers, those could be lowered before producing CreateNets AR in a higher level. Another one of the big ideas um, is, is it's still um, in kind of the early phases is to use an ECS-like design, Entity Component System. Um, this is something that's got a lot of attention in Rust um, recently. Um, and the idea is that instead of having um, a large soup of pointers, essentially, uh, a lot of compiler data structures are basically just big uh, graphs of pointers. Um, in in CraneLeft, what we have is the large arrays, essentially arenas. Um, and indices into arrays. So we're doing the same kinds of things. We have the same kind of data structures, it's the same kind of graphs, um, but instead of just pointers everywhere, it's indices into arrays. Uh, and this has a couple of advantages that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. I just wanted to go back and look at the Queen's AR example again. Um, one interesting thing to point out here is that the numbers you see, so the value numbers on the left of every instruction, we see anything like V2 equals C2 more const. Um, those value numbers uh, aren't arbitrary strings. Those are actually, when it says V2, that's actually index two in the value table. Um, when we see SS0 for the stack slot, that's actually um, stack slot zero in the stack slot table. Um, and so you can, you can very clearly see all the indices um, in, the, in the textual dump. This also means that when we dump out the IR and then read back in, all the indices can be preserved. So everything can be preserved, recreated exactly how it was in the order that it was. Um, this can be really handy for debugging because we can dump out IR and read it back in. And I don't have to worry about things um, changing order or moving around. Everything can be preserved. So ECS is cool. Um, uh, one of the cool things we can do with ECS is a, a thing called a secondary map. Um, so a, a common need in compilers is when you have um, something you care about, like instructions or basic blocks, you often want to associate extra information um, for every instruction or extra information for every basic block. Um, and the ECS system makes that really easy to do. We have a concept called a secondary map, which is basically another array that uses the same index space as your, as your primary array. Um, and so you can use one index to look up the main instruction in the instruction table. We can use that same index to look up the auxiliary information in your secondary table. Um, and so it's very quick. We don't need to have a lot of hash maps uh, to, to associate extra information. We can just use, use the index spaces. Um, and creating this entity system has 
distinguished types for the indices. So it's very difficult. So you're so prevented from using an index into the wrong table because we have all type safe indices. So second pair maps are really cool. Um, although we're as we're getting uh, further into this kind of design, we're actually finding there's some some shortcuts short shortcomings that we're running into that's causing some problems. Um, one of them is that we're not really using ECS in a kind of conventional way when you think about using ECS in a game engine. Um, a common use for ECS is that you would like start a lot of your arrays, you'll be doing um, just linear iterations and like I want to visit all the entities and so you just walk through the array. Um, but in Craneleft, because we're basically representing graph data structures and we're doing a lot of graph traversals, um, a lot of what we end up doing is random access into these arrays. So we just have, you know, here's an instruction, I want to see what operands it are, operands it has, those are indices in the value table. I want to see what operands they have. Those are more indices. So we end up doing essentially what, what ends up looking like pointer chasing, but it's actually just like index and array chasing. Um, these are all random access, accesses. Um, and of course, we're using Rust, so that means these are all bounds checked. And we actually did some experiments recently where we, we, we did some tricks to disable the bounds checks and found that it sped up compilation time of Craneleft overall by 8%. Um, that's kind of a lot, and it kind of shows you how heavily we're actually leaning on this technique of, of using arrays and using random access into arrays. Um, so we kind of have this open question there about um, 8% is a lot. We're not really interested in leaving that on the table. Um, and we don't have the same kind of problem that a lot of our array access uses have. We're not doing indices. Uh, we're not doing arithmetic on our indices. The indices are basically just these opaque tokens. Um, and so it's very unlikely that we'll ever actually access an array out of bounds because we're never using an arbitrary index. We're all just using a token that was given to us from the array itself. Um, and so you could argue that we don't really need those bound checks. Um, and so the kind of question is, like, should we add unsafe? To give back that eight percent, should we make that an option to our users, like a, a cargo feature or something? Um, so it's an interesting design trade-off question that we're sort of figuring out there as, as we uh, get further into this ECS design. And one question about that: Do you uh, do you what do you do if you, for example, remove a basic block with its what happens to its index in that case? That's right. So if we remove uh, a block, um, in our case, the index just remains um, essentially dead at that point, and we'll never reuse it. Um, and so we just have we just remove the block from the code and we delete all references to it and then we basically just leak that index and never try to reuse it. Okay. Um, that makes things simpler for us and and because because again it's also the getting back to the cogen focus, we're not doing a lot of um, of aggressive sort of deleting instructions or creating you know reorganizing instructions. Um, most things we assume in cogen are going to be pretty close to the form that they're going to look like in the output and so we don't need a lot of reuse. And actually, that, that simplifies our entity compose system a lot because we don't need to do things like the, the generational system with indices or try to keep track of, of you know, is this index dangling somehow? Um, and, but yeah, we can get away with that because we know we're a compiler back end and we're compiling just one function. At the end of that function, we're going to blow everything away and do the next function. So we can, we can, we can get away with wasting a little bit of memory. Um, and and in, in return, we can actually save memory by not having to have all this, uh, like every index having to have a generation attached to it, for example. Um, another challenge we found with the system is that we end up keeping a lot of arrays around in memory. Um, Craneleft is designed to be um, quite paranoid about calling malloc. Um, I wonder if actually is, it's too paranoid. Um, but we have a bunch of arrays. We have the instruction array, we have the data array, or the, the value array, we have basic block array, we have uh, stack slot array, so the, uh, tables. And we just keep all these tables around. And we have the ability, like when you're done compiling one function, we can call clear on the function, and it calls clear on all of its underlying tables, which are vex. Um, and that allows us to hold on to the allocations. This size is set to zero, but the capacity remains allocated, um, which is a way to uh, avoid calling malloc between functions. Um, but it means that each of these tables grows to the size of the biggest table across the entire set of functions you want to compile. Um, and it potentially means our high watermark for memory usage is higher than it needs to be. Um, one of the things that we're kind of thinking about as an alternative, um, I'm really a big fan of the, the LIFO alloc data structure in SpiderMonkey. So LIFO alloc is basically just a big bug pointer allocator, and it really fits the kind of compiler use case where you're saying, I'm going to compile one function, and while I'm compiling, I'm just going to bug pointer alloc and not try to reuse any memory at all, and just alloc, 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 and then throw the whole thing away once that function is done. Um, that fits, uh, especially if you're thinking about a, a, if you just want fast compilation, um, that's a really fast pattern, and it worked really well for kind of a code general use case. Um, and it also means that we could probably get away with actually freeing and, and, and shrinking our memory usage more often. Right now, we don't do that very often because we have lots of um, medium-sized arrays and one big array. Um, and so we, we end up paying more because we, the sum of all the medium-sized arrays is more than uh, the one big array would have to be. 
You're familiar so with the typed arena crate, right? And similar yes. crates. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so those are the kind of things we're looking at. Um, uh, and that's that'll be an interesting experiment to do. Um, one thing that I've I've sort of missed is um, at least coming from Spider Monkey, um, the the life oil crate has the ability. There's a vector class that's sort of already set up to use the life as a backing store. And so you basically you can just have um, relatively normal vectors to write code with. So I don't have to worry about you know trying to manage your your underlying allocation. You can just read like a vector and it automatically allocates out of the life alloc. Everything just automatically has the right lifetime and just goes away when you want it to. So that's a that's an interesting possibility area we want to explore. Um, that may end up moving us away from the ECS system because we may just have like one big arena. And then we might just look at using regular pointers instead of indices. Um, although that's an interesting question because using indices means we can use 32-bit indices rather than 64-bit indices. We can save uh, half of our memory because so much of our, our data structures is pointers and other data structures. Um, another potential downside is the dense memory usage. Um, I mentioned the secondary map thing that we're doing where we basically create a side array to describe extra data along with the primary array. Um, this is pretty cool when that array ends up being dense because it's just one big dense array. Um, but when it's sparse, um, we use a lot of memory because we use a full array, an element for every instruction, where if we only need to out annotate a small number of instructions, we're using a lot more memory than we do. So I think the system kind of encourages us towards secondary maps, but sometimes we do that too much, and we should probably just actually go back to hash maps to use less memory in some cases. Uh, I don't know if it's visible in the recording, so I'm just going to repeat that uh, Alexi Matclad wrote bump, that the bump alloc crate may also be worth looking at. Ah. That. Yeah, that's good to know. I haven't actually taken a survey of all the different options out there, so it's good to know what those are. Just as a data point, I think the compiler moved towards hash maps versus there were a couple of places where we were using dense arrays, and we also move pretty universally to hash maps for our secondary maps for the same reason. But it's just the overhead isn't that high when they're dense, and the, the sparse cost is too high. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, so I guess this um, kind of a tangent here, but also I wanted to address the topic about like why don't we use uh, WebAssembly as our IR? Um, and, and a couple of quick questions to that. One of them is that WebAssembly is designed to be a safe language. And some of the stuff that code generators do is just fundamentally unsafe. Uh, for example, one of the things we want to do with, with array access is it optimizes away bounds checks. Um, and it's it's not possible to represent an array X without a bounce check on it without being unsafe at some level. So like WebAssembly can't represent that as a, as a direct concept. Um, and so we need the ability to represent things that are unsafe because we've proven them um, they're safe. Um, Another thing is that we're actually looking to use CraneLeft as a backend for more than just WebAssembly. We're using, looking at using it as a backend for the Rust compiler as well. And Rust, um, being a systems language, wants relatively complete access to the underlying platform. It wants all the goodies, all the you know, intrinsics, all the special calling conventions. We want to exploit all those things. And so we can't do that with WebAssembly. We need to have a much more uh, complete IR is, is where we're going to go. Um, an interesting design question that I just wanted to bring up here in case people have thoughts about this. Um, we're kind of going through this, so we don't really have a lot of clear guidelines. So whenever we're talking about adding a feature, um, we can add things as an IR construct directly, or we can we can lower things on the front end. Uh, for example, pretty recently we had someone contribute a patch to allow us to do um, memcopy. If you're a front end and you want to you know, copy a, a struct or an array, you want to be able to call memcopy, um, one option that we could have done is we could have put a memcopy uh, instruction in the IR and then um, the, the legalization phase could turn that instruction into a, into a memory copy call as appropriate. Um, what we ended up doing is we actually ended up having the front end, uh, creating the front end create, um, expose an API call for just calling memory copy. And what it does is as it produces IR, instead of creating a memory copy instruction, it just creates um, the memory copy call directly. Or in the, in the optimizing case, if you're making a small memory copy, um, it'll actually just emit loads of stores directly. So the IR data structure itself never actually has a memory copy instruction. Um, and this is a question that we have kind of over and over again, and we don't actually have a lot of clear answers for you know, when should we do something in one side or another. Um, how, how high level should the IR be? Um, and a lot of it comes down to, like, does having things as an opcode add value? Does it allow us to optimize things more than we would otherwise? Um, and with memcopy, the answer is not really, because we're not, as, as a code generator oriented create, we're not really focused on things like memcopy optimizations. That'll be something that'll be higher level. Um, so right now, it doesn't make sense for having an code for that. Um, but this is a question that we'll probably end up um, re reviewing at some point. We also have questions for um, like arbitrary size integers, or people want even just I128. If you want the I128 type that Rust has, um, should we add that to the IR, or should we have front ends lower that before they go to the IR? Um, 
is kind of an open issue for that, and we don't actually even have an answer for that. So it's sort of an interesting uh, question that we're kind of looking for if people have opinions or insights on that. Um, this you could almost even think of this question as extending to SSA construction. Um, we went all the way and said we're not even going to have an IR that can represent non-SSA form at all. So in order to even produce IR, you have to have SSA form up front. Uh, this can be uh, awkward for front ends because not all front ends have SSA form coming in. Um, and so we basically pushed SSA construction into the create enough front end crate. We have a pretty simple API that you can use. Um, you can declare a variable, and then once you've declared a variable, then you can use it and you can define it or, or assign a value to it. Um, so use it is just a function that you give a variable handle and it gives you the value at that point. And to define it, you give it a variable and a value to assign it to. And what this does is actually it constructs SSA form under the covers. So given the uses and defs, um, it will insert the block parameters uh, fees as needed um, in order to sort of satisfy your SSA conditions. And so we've we've um, in in the in the spirit of thinking about what belongs in the AR versus what belongs in the front end, we were actually able to push SSA construction into the front end so that the back end and the data structures don't even need to worry about the possibility of being non-SSA form. Um, and we don't even need to worry about things like uh, meant to reg as, as, as LVM typically does it, where you sort of have this non-SSA form represented as memory, but it's kind of a special memory that could be optimized. Um, we just have a single form that just registers, and you produce those registers as you produce the IR, and you can use this, this API to do it. All right, that sort of concludes my, my brief tour of the, the IR. Now I want to move on to optimization um, and talk about first optimization that, that Crane itself is doing today, um, and then also talk about um, what kind of optimizations we want to do in the future and, and how we can how we can arrange a compiler to help make those optimizations possible. Um, so first, Crane we're we're currently focused on being a code generator, and so we're doing that sort of code and optimization things. Um, one of those is translating from Crane relatively mid-level IR, um, which has some abstractions. Um, into machine level IR, um, which basically uses machine opcodes. So an example of that is like the pop code instruction. In Queen, the pop code is just an instruction opcode. Um, but of course, not all hardware platforms have a pop code instruction. So if you do have it, obviously we can just use that instruction. If you don't, that pop code instruction might turn into a sequence of instructions or, or maybe even a library call. Um, and so we call this process of, of turning things that are not uh, legal uh, for the machine, um, being a machine has no equivalent to that opcode. Uh, into things that are legal for the machine. I mean, the machine has a thing that is like, like a pop code instruction that, that exactly corresponds to the operation we're doing. Um, and this is this is sort of the same process of, uh, we also call this lowering, um, and it's also sort of the same thing as instruction selection at some level, just like deciding what machine opcodes we're going to use to implement particular constructs. Uh, Creative doesn't currently have a very fancy system for doing this. We just kind of walk through the code and expand one thing at a time. Uh, but this is an area where um, there's been a lot of academic work in this area, and a lot of um, just state of the art is pretty advanced in this area of, of having a fancy system for deciding the best way to lower particular instruction or, or, or to tile a set of instructions with, with machine outcodes. Um, that's an area that we're hoping to get into in the future that we don't do yet, um, so I don't have a lot to say about it yet. Um, one of the things that happens kind of in any compiler, whenever you lower, whenever you go from any IR, to another IR that's lower level, it almost always exposes redundancies because the higher level IR typically has redundancies that are, that are implicit, that are kind of bound up in the operation because it's doing many things. When you expand it into a simpler operation, those redundancies become exposed. And of course, whenever you do that, um, it becomes valuable to do things like GBN, LACM, to get rid of the, the redundancies. GBN is just optimization that looks for the same expression occurring multiple times. Um, and instead of computing multiple times, we just compute it once and hold the value in a register. Uh, LACM is conceptually the same thing, except that it works across loop boundaries. So if you're computing the same value every iteration of a loop, you can compute it once outside of a loop and just reuse that value in the register every iteration of the loop. And so these are the kind of things that become exposed um, after lowering. Uh, then code elimination is, is the same theory of, uh, after lowering, parts of the operations become unneeded, um, and you can delete those parts that are unneeded. Can I ask a question about this? Uh, mm -hmm. What are you lowering to? You're lowering to the actual target assembly? So what we're actually lowering to is um, we actually so we keep our same IR, but we annotate the instructions with uh, a machine opcode encoding. So we have the IAD instruction, which is just a um, in in in, a, in the mid-level IR, it's just a pure IAD. You know, it's an integer add, it's two upper ends, doesn't add, and it produces a result of the same type. 
Um, and then we can do is we can take that same instruction without changing it, and we just assign it, say like, okay, it's actually, this instruction happens to correspond directly to a thing that x86 can do. And so we just give it an encoding and say, like, here's the, here's the x86 opcode, which does what this does. I see. Um, and so this JVN or whatever, these, these optimizations, they would basically be applied on this encodings? That's like right. So they produce a smaller set of instructions than would otherwise be necessary because you know that it's dominated by the values available somewhere else or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So they can actually ignore the encodings for the most part. Um, I mean, when they're, when they're actually deleting instructions, they need to be careful. But um, when you're trying to find, like, is this expression, you know, uh, congruent, to use the term, um, to an earlier expression, um, that the opcode doesn't, the, the machine encoding doesn't come into it. They can actually just look at the, the IR level opcode, which is just like I add and, and sort of high level opcodes um, so, and, and decide, okay, this is, this is the same in my hash map. This, this maps the same thing. And so I can, I can delete this one and then it becomes a matter of just doing the rewrite. So you're doing the optimization at the level of crane lift IR, not at the level of the instru selected instructions. It's sort of both. Um, Crayleft AR is at that point lowered to the level of stalking instructions because we use the Crayleft AR instructions, and now those instructions are annotated with um, the, the the machine. Like here's a cookie that says how how to encode it when it comes out of hardware. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to understand is like, do you need to know the result of lowering to know that you can do the optimization? So for GVN and ICM, you don't need to know that. They actually work. Um, we, we don't currently run them before lowering, but you could, and they would work. They'd be just okay. fine. Uh, register allocation. Um, I don't have a lot to say about that here. That's kind of a bigger topic for this um, for this talk. But um, we do SSA-based register allocation, so we preserve SSA form all the way through. Um, it's kind of this, this the, using the Sebastian hack technique of um, doing spilling first to make sure that your SSA graph um, can be allocated on the machine. Um, and then we can observe the, the, the basic application of SSA register allocation is that an SSA graph, the, the interference graph for it is a chordal graph and you can color it in linear time. So in theory, it's very fast, uh, but in practice, what we've really done is we've split a hard problem, register allocation into two halves. One of them, which we call register allocation, becomes the easy problem. Um, and then the hard problem gets split into the first half, which is the spilling problem, which is sort of a, we can we can say that we made register allocation easy by splitting out the hard part into a separate problem. Um, it's sort of this little trick that compiler writers like to do. So, um, so it ends up that register allocation is, is actually um, not as fast as we would hope it to be right now, and so that's actually an area we need to more work on. Um, but again, that's kind of a big topic, and I'm going to um, stick to more high-level stuff in this talk. Um, and after that's done, um, the code actually is ready to go. Once we have registers, that's enough for us to encode machine instructions. The, the cookie that says what, up, what machine upgrade this can you use, plus you know, what registers this can you use, also what's, what stack slots in case we still spill anything. Um, and now we can, we can put up machine code. But um, at this point, we can also do encoding optimizations. Once we know how big the instructions are, that's the time we can do things like um, branch. Um, so for example, x86 has, has branch immediate. So there's a branch that has an 8-bit immediate, and there's a branch that has a 32-bit immediate. And depending on how far the branch needs to go, you can do a smaller immediate or a bigger immediate. Um, once we know how big, what, what the actual file encoding all the instructions are, we know how far apart everything is, and we can pick the actual branch uh, targets. So we do sort of this final pass of, of encoding operations at the end. Um, and that's basically it. So that's kind of the, the, the rough tour of like major code level operations. Um, I should also mention that like one of the reasons why code generation can be this simple is that modern hardware, especially x86 chips, um, but also high-end ARM chips these days, um, does a lot of stuff that compilers uh, otherwise used to think was their job, like instruction scheduling um, is something that we do we, to a first approximation don't have to worry about. Um, there still will be a place for it, and we may actually look at doing it someday, but um, but for a while, you can basically just rely on the hardware to schedule for you. It does a pretty good job. So that's what we're doing today. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about like looking forward at uh, high-level optimizations that we might want to do in the future. Um, this is kind of a big topic, and we don't have a lot of specific plans here, but we do have some, some high-level ideas for what, what shape things need to take. Uh, the very first thing we did we need to figure out, um, sort of the, the frame upon which a lot of stuff will be built, is inlining. Um, inlining, you can either think of it, some people call it the mother of all optimization, some people call it the poor man's interprocedural analysis, um, but inlining really is the thing that makes it possible to do a lot of optimization in a language like Rust, where so many abstractions are basically just function calls that are expected to be clapped down into small in inline sequences of code. Um, 
And so we need to figure out an inline story. I mentioned that um, Crane lifts, the code generator, is organized to just think about one function at a time. So it actually isn't very well positioned to do inlining. Um, and I expect to do a mid level optimizer, we would have to add another layer between um, what we currently think of as Rust and, and Crane lifts. Um, that would add the ability to think about multiple functions at a time and, and be able to inline one into another. Um, so inlining is really important. Um, of course, once you do inlining, then, then we're back to our same old story again. Um, eliminate redundancies. Um, of course, at the mid level optimizer, this is extended to include eliminating redundancies between loads and stores, which is really important. Um, and we can also think about, um, again, think about eliminating redundancies between loop iterations, and, and we also extend that to loads of stores, so doing you know, hoisting loads out of loops, sticking stores out of loops, and, and promoting loads of stores and loops into registers. Um, and the other sort of big high-level task that, that middle optimizers need to do is, is user, use cheaper instructions. Um, and that's, that's constant folding, but I also sort of group in that category algebraic simplifications, just like, you know, multiply is more expensive than shift, so convert multiplies into shifts. Um, also more complex things. Um, and also bright optimizations. Whenever you have a branch, you can prove the condition is constant, you can fold that away and, and, and result in more simplifications. Um, and so most of these things, um, uh, we don't need a lot of help in terms of, like, what can, what can people, what can finance people producing IR need to do for us. Uh, inlining, we'll need help to figure out um, you know, how can we organize the compiler to manage multiple functions and just in terms of the data structure and, and managing uh, memory inside the compiler. Um, but the main thing what we need, we really care about, what we really care about what the fund is telling us is memory instructions. So loads and stores, um, eliminating redundancy between memory operations. Um, I guess I forgot to have this slide here. So inlining, um, one of the big things with inlining is also heuristics. Um, and so that'll be an interesting question going forward is how you decide what to inline and when. It might be the case, right, at least for Rust, that we could do the inlining before you, we even reach you. Right? Yeah, um, and actually, I suspect that we might end up with, with both, um, is kind of what I'm thinking. So certainly with Rust, um, you have so many abstractions, so many small functions that are just essentially syntax sugar for inlining and abstraction right into, into place. Um, it almost becomes a property of the language, and you almost can think of it in terms of like the front end should just be aligning these things because you, like, you never ever want to have this code without having it be inlined. Yeah, maybe even in, in debug mode, you just want to inline those things always. Um, and that's that's a different set of heuristics. Um, those those abstraction levels that are conceptually just like the user writes this with the expectation that it'll always be inlined is kind of a different level of inlining than um, what sometimes people call back end inlining, which is sort of more focused on. Okay, now I'm going to try to make a heuristic that I'm going to try to balance code size versus performance. And I try to make a clever decision about, you know, if I inline this, um, are the arguments constants that could be folded away if I in, in the inline body? Um, or is this inside of a hot loop? These kind of questions. Um, feels like a different set of heuristics. So I can see a place where Rust at the mirror level inlines the first category of things. I'm just like, I'm doing the things that I consider to be abstractions that should always be inlined. Um, and the second level is now I'm going to try to like I'm going to think about the machine I'm on. I'm going to think about you know try to think about iCache locality and try to think about those kind of things and make a semi-intelligent decision about whether it's worth it to inline at that level. Um, might just be a separate inliner at some point. So that's a an interesting um, trade-off. Uh, I sometimes talk about um, the way compiler writers want to write compilers is we kind of want to see code the way it would look like if uh, a programmer from the 70s wrote C code. Um, and the way programmers in the 70s write C code is like when they have things that they want to inline, they don't write functions, they write macros because that's how you inline things in the 70s, right? And so that kind of code um, turns out to be kind of a coincidence, but also kind of a result of the way C worked in, in, in that era was kind of this low level assembly language where the programmer was kind of thinking in terms of um, how should I lay out the code in a way that will compile into good code. And so we kind of want front ends to produce for us that kind of code. That's what we want things to look like. We want things to have, like, if a, if a smart programmer in the 70s would have written a macro for this, we want the front end to have inlined it for us, uh, ideally. So that's kind of our, that's kind of our like, ideal picture of, like, you know, if you give us the best possible code, that's what it would look like, is these sort of medium-sized functions, not too big, um, but not small functions, because those probably should have been inlined. And, um, and relatively simple code that's not doing a lot of abstract things, and, and that's really what we can operate well on. So if the front end can, can collapse away the things that would have been macros um, you know, in an earlier, more primitive era, um, that's great for us. If, if, if the front end doesn't do it for us, we'll probably end up doing it ourselves. But I think actually 
um, one of my ideas is that uh, front ends actually have a better idea of what you can think of as a, a abstraction versus this a pure heuristic approach of just like looking at code size and looking trying to guess about about constant folding and what can be possible. So moving beyond inlining, like looking at memory redundancies, um, this is one of the one of the big big tasks. Um, in fact, we, we it's it's such a big task we split it up into many categories. We call it GVM, we call it redundant load elimination, we call it LACM, we call it dead stored elimination, stored load forwarding, SROA, scalar replacement, you know, register promotion, all these basically names are essentially names for the same thing of trying to get rid of redundant loads on stores and trying to turn, instead of going through memory, can we hold values and registers more and can we just avoid you know, doing the same load multiple times or avoid doing stores that we don't need. Um, and so even though you look at a compiler like LVM optimizer has lots of different passes, um, many of the passes are actually doing the same thing. Like there's probably about six or seven passes that are basically all just doing the same version of, of GVM, or these specialized forms of it. Um, looking beyond that, if you want to talk about like what are the other bigger things that optimizers want to do, um, if you want to get fancy with loops, there's a lot of different things: fission, fusion interchange, vectorization. Um, we can split this into two halves. There's the, the transform half, which is of the mechanics of like taking a loop and doing some some advanced transformations to it. But the first half of that is the analysis. We need to analyze the loop and say, now, first of all, what is safe to do in this loop? Is it possible to to do interchange? Um, is it possible to do uh, other kind of uh, optimizations that would change the order that things would happen in. Um, and so this also kind of boils down to a memory dependence question of, of can I reorder two operations? And so if you really boil it down to like what questions does the optimizer want to ask? Um, uh, one of the insights that I, I think we can take is um, it's, it's typical for compilers to think in terms of alias analysis, in terms of think of, of can I prove these two pointers are the same or different? Um, and that actually ends up being more of a use, uh, a means rather than an end. The question that we really want to ask is, if I have a loader store or a call, can I move it past some other loader store? Um, and so it really becomes, the question isn't, um, is this load loading from the same address as that store? It's, is it safe to move this load across that store? Um, and so that's actually another reason why uh, we think that pointer types in the IR aren't the important part. If we can get a front end, that can provide us with high-level um, memory dependence information about you know, what stores depend on what loads and what loads depend on what stores and so on. Then we think we can get away without having to do um, pointer analysis, which is really attractive because pointer analysis in compilers is really complicated and really error-prone. It tends to get caught up and, and fail um, in a lot of ways, um, in sort of a very confusing way, because you end up having to have these very complex solvers that can't explain how they came up with the answers they came up with. And so if we can have a system like Rust, which is really attractive. I feel like you're doing a trick, like register allocation trick. You're like, here's this hard problem. What if we made you tell us the answer? Then it wouldn't well, be such a hard problem. But I agree, we probably can supply that information. So the hard problem is, in, in alias analysis, is, is you throw away, or you, you start with a situation where you have all these pointers and you know nothing. And you basically have to sort of reverse engineer the pointer relationships from nothing. You kind of have this system of, you know, like look at all the assignments of pointer transfers and put them all in a big constraint system and solve it. And uh, in a language like Rust that has, for example, an immutable reference, you just know up front that, that loads from that thing are all going to be the same value. And so if we can represent that information, if we just remember that, instead of throwing it away or instead of having to, to represent that as like some complicated metadata, if we just remember this in, in a first class way in, a, in Optimizer IR, um, then it could make all the things we want to do, all these optimizations, um, and it's it's a large part of what optimizers do is just basically this kind of set of things of you know can I move these stores past these other stores or can I move these loads across these stores or calls? Um, yeah, um, that would basically give us a lot of stuff for free, which is really attractive. It also and gets then, you out of the business of like the C's type based alias analysis and all that. Yeah, type based alias analysis in C um, is 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 notoriously problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, and it gets us out of the business of trying to, I mean, if you look at LVM, for example, there's this, this question of, of like they're trying to do um, memory semantics and it's very difficult because the, the rules for what, um, even just trying to describe what GDN is doing today is, is actually quite complicated um, because they kind of have all these like you know, discovered rules about, you know, this seems to work across a large body of C++ code base, so we'll just do this. Um, and then trying to sort of extract a formal set of rules for like what is that actually doing um, has been very difficult to practice and no one actually knows you know, what the rules are. 
Whereas if we can express a system in terms of dependencies, basically saying, you know, I don't know anything about pointers, um, but if you tell me that this load can't cross that store, I can represent a, a dependency in a dependence graph and just preserve that property. And it's actually really easy to reason about. Um, I think it's also interesting to bring up another example of the C restrict pointer uh, feature. C has this, this uh, keyword called restrict, um, which is kind of confusing. But one of the one of the key insights that I think they had, um, we think it's a really good insight, was that you can't um, discuss uh, or the, the the chain of computation matters. So like how you get a pointer matters. There's a, we we can't discuss like all the different possible ways that you can get from one pointer to computing to another pointer value. There's there's just too many ways for pointers to flow through programs. So they kind of have to sort of cut that out and basically say if there's any possible path that this pointer can be derived from another pointer, um, then that's sufficient to sort of satisfy the restrict qualifier pointer uh, concept. And I think what we can do here is actually kind of take another step further and say, like, let's get away from pointer values altogether. I'm not care about um, pointer equality or pointer inequality, because those actually aren't the key things. Pointers, or a load in the store can alias, even if they have different pointers, because if you have a different size load from the store, um, you still care about that dependency, even though the pointers aren't, aren't equal. Um, or if, if sometimes the C++ standard gets confused about whether or not you should be caring about people who map the same memory into multiple places in their address space at the same time, um, which then has two different pointers that can have accesses that are dependent on each other despite having completely different addresses. Um, and so if we want to think about those kind of things, um, again, we want to get back to thinking about dependencies and what can you move past what else. And that's um, really the, um, the important part. Let's see. Am I getting pinged on IRC? No. OK. Um, and so this, this goes all the way up. So we also, I talked before about loop, loop optimizations kind of being the sort of the next level um, um, high tech thing that, that compilers can do. Um, memory redundancies are basically the big answer there as far as what do you care about in terms of the analysis side. Of course, there's also the side of, of you know, machine heuristics and, and cost models um, and transformations. But if you want to know, like, is it safe to vectorize this loop? Is it safe to cache block this loop? Um, or at what distance can I vectorize? Those kind of things also turn into memory, um, memory dependence kind of questions. Um, you care about um, not just what other store instruction in the IR, but uh, transforming it into the runtime domain and thinking about how many iterations ahead um, is, is, a, is another store that will depend on, that, I'll, that I can't cross. Um, and so this all kind of collapses into the same problem. Now loops, of course, they're, they're different than the straight line code. The, the redundancy is at runtime rather than at compile time. So we need different mechanisms for thinking about loops. But I think this is kind of the basic model that we want to think in terms of, of you know, here's a load or a store. What are the same set of things above it that it can't cross? Um, sometimes this can be uh, expensive to represent in, in compilers because if you have a whole bunch of stores to array accesses, you have one load. Um, we kind of want to basically say that that load has to be depending on every single store that came before it because you know it can't cross any of them. They're all sort of visible. Um, and one way we have to, to simplify this is to make it conservative is just to say that every store depends on every previous store or has a, uh, a dependency that if we really care, we can, we can sort of look at the two stores and figure it out um, if we know that one of them doesn't alias the other one. But in order to, to sort of factor the dependencies to avoid uh, an M times N dependence tree, we can basically say every store, is gonna, like we're going to serialize all the stores, but then loads will all just point to the one most recent store that they would depend on kind of a cheaper way to do it. So that's actually kind of a good um, balancing point where we can have an intermediate uh, fast point. One of, one of Crane Left's goals is to be useful as a, um, what I call the pretty good compiler, which is a compiler that can optimize decently well with, with quite fast compile times. So not the highest quality performance, um, but also fast enough that um, in, in typical builds, debug builds are, like, are so slow because you're not doing any inlining or not doing enough inlining. Um, if we could have kind of a middle balance where you could have enough code to be usable for day-to-day like, -day development purposes, enough optimization to be usable for development purposes, but also um, fast compile times would be a very volatile thing to have. So that's kind of an intermediate step that I see as building. And this kind of a model where you basically like take all the stores in and serialize them um, makes it very cheap to represent this kind of dependence graph because it's just one edge per store and per load. Um, and I also wanted to talk briefly about uh, redundant load elimination. And actually, this is kind of with a view of doing redundant load elimination on Lear. Um, there's a data structure and actually a really, a really cool technique for doing this that um, we can use a data structure called the scope hash map, um, which is basically a hash map 
where you have checkpoints and rewind the checkpoints. So you can basically say, you know, take this hash map, put a bunch of things in it, make a checkpoint, you know, put more things in it, and then decide that you're done, and then rewind to this earlier point, and then reuse the hash map going forward. You can add more things and, and make more checkpoints, and then rewind that point. And that maps up really well with a dominator tree um, depth first search traversal. So if we're walking down the dominator tree, every time we go down a level, we can make a hash, we can make a checkpoint, um, and then we we you know keep walking the instructions in, the, in that um, dominator tree node, adding the instructions there. And then um, when we're done, we're going to pop back up the DFS stack. Then we can just like rewind to that checkpoint and go down the next branch of the DFS tree. So at any given point, we have a hash map which represents all the things that are that are dominating um, the particular point that you're at. So this kind of scope hash map is actually pretty easy to build. There's an example of one in Crayneft, um, and it's it's really efficient. And you can do a dominator tree search, and this is basically enough. Um, if you have, for example, um, at Rust Mirror, if you just want to do redundant load elevation over um, immutable references. Um, if you can build a dominator tree and you can do a, a scope hash map traversal over it, um, you can do this pretty quickly and pretty efficiently. Um, this is better. I've heard some people have tossed around the idea of just like let's hoist all the loads to the entry block or sort of to the highest up point that they can go. Um, I think doing this in terms of like let's take the loads where they are and just eliminate the redundant ones is actually a little bit safer to do in terms of compile time because maximally hoisting loads can increase register pressure. Um, in the compiler because we'll be lengthening live ranges. I mean, the, the flip side of, of factoring out redundant loads is that we're holding things in registers, which is great if you have enough registers available. But if you don't, then we could end up spilling things. We can, it causes us to potentially make worse code in some cases. So it's sort of a conservative thing of, of don't move any loads, but just delete redundant ones. It's sort of a good uh, trade-off point. And you can do it pretty easily with a scope half map and, and dominator tree kind of approach. Um, dominator tree kind of approach, this is also, um, one other thing I say about this approach is you can extend it through GVN. So GVN also wants the same thing. It wants a hash map that wants to be sort of scoped per, per dominator tree traversal. Um, and so you can extend this kind of concept to just hash map any kind of arbitrary expressions. Um, Rust mirror doesn't have SSA form, which makes the GVN a little bit more complex. Um, but uh, one of the ideas there is that you could rely on the fact that you have immutable references or immutable lead bindings by default, and you can sort of treat those as SSA values. You can sort of limit yourself to just those values um, you might be able to get a fair amount done, and it might allow you to delete um, you know, code, just have less code, which might which means less work for subsequent passes to do, which could which could speed up compile time. So, it's a, it's an interesting thing to consider. Um, of course, doing GVN isn't free. You're doing a lot of hash map lookups, so there's a there's a trade off to be made there. As a random aside, I expect that the index map crate would be really nice for implementing scoped hash maps, and it's also really pretty fast. Uh, so it lets you kind of push things and then pop them by index, if I recall, though I'm not sure. Um, but yes, I think you can do that. I don't know the efficiency. If you want to pop a whole bunch of things at once, I don't know if it's it's the most efficient for that offhand. But 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 yeah, certainly it's worth looking at. Uh, regarding um, SSA and not SSA, I mean, it seems like yeah, even without looking at how your user declared the let declaration, you could simply look for kind of the final assignment or something like that. Like there, we should, there's like a large immutable span likely for most variables, even those that are declared mute. Often, I think, have a sort of mutation period and, and a use period. But anyway. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and also, just within a basic block, it's pretty easy to just, if, you, if you're doing a top-down walk of the basic block, it's pretty easy to just remember the most recent def of something you've seen. Um, I think the only case where it's really tricky is when you have a, a, a use of variable that's defined you know, in some other um, control condition basic block whatever you want to call it. Um, and so you don't know exactly which depth it is. But everything else, it's actually pretty easy to sort of keep uh, a subset of SLC form uh, on the fly. So you could do a pretty good job with doing a, a GVN on the fly like this. All right, and it's all uh, finished up here. I just want to give a kind of brief status of, of the Queen of the Compile System. Um, first, we have our, our GitHub site here. Um, cool thing that's going on, the Rust community probably is interested in. Um, uh, Bjorn 3 is working on a backend for the Rust compiler built on this. Um, this is kind of built on a lot of different pieces that have been kind of slowly coming into place. Um, so Dennis Marigu did a lot of work with us this last summer to uh, to refactor the Rust backend so that uh, all the code that Rust has for translating into LVM now goes through a trait. And so this, this trait uh, now currently just has a single implementation in the tree, which is the LVM trait. So it's basically just like making all the same LVM API calls and then just making them into LVM. 
Um, but now what we're going to be able to do, and what this what this new code generator is built on, is the ability to like, implement this create implement this trait um, with CreateLift as backend instead. CreateLift's IR builder is pretty similar to LVM's IR builder. Um, there are some differences, but it's sort of within distance of of generalizing these traits to to produce either LVM IR or CreateLift IR. And this is actually a really good way of, of factoring the backend because there's a lot of code in in Rust for the translation from mirror to, to LVM IR. That's kind of where a lot of the policy happens, where of, like lowering match statements and lowering enums and all the different stuff that, that Rust has that, that don't exist in the LVMAR or create if they are. Um, we can share all that code basically by using these traits. So that's actually a pretty cool system. So definitely check it out. Um, and that's all the content I have now. Are there any other questions? I have a question. What mm -hmm. other uses of CraneLift outside of Rust C are there and are anticipated? Yeah, so some of the major ones, um, we're using CraneLifts um, in SpiderMonkey to do WebAssembly compilation, um, and that's actually that's something that's, that's an ongoing project. Uh, we have it in Firefox Nightly. If you, if you get Firefox Nightly and, and flip a flag, you can enable CraneLift compilation for WebAssembly. It's not very fast yet uh, because we have more optimization work to do yet, but that's, that's in place in the tree, and it passed the test suite, so we're kind of uh, moving forward there. Um, another major use of CraneLift is uh, a WASM engine that I'm building called WASMTime. And I'm, I'm building with this with the hope that, that we're going to sort of broaden the scope of WebAssembly to non web use cases. So we can put together a, a sort of coalition of people that are interested in, in working on what, with us on, on taking WebAssembly beyond the web. Uh, the big focus right now is actually building out a set of APIs for um, talking to the file system in, in a sandboxed way. So if you want to be able to do you know, open files and do that kind of thing with IO um, outside a browser, we can do that kind of thing, but we don't just want to give our WebAssembly programs full access to the file system because the whole benefit of WebAssembly is that they're sandboxed. So this is a big thing we're working on in, in Wasm time right now, so definitely check out Wasm time. Um, uh, another, another big user of, of CraneLift is, is Fastly. So Fastly is also using CraneLift to do WebAssembly calibration, and they're doing WebAssembly calibration um, in the edge. Fastly um, is, is a CDN, and so they provide, um, they have servers around the world, and they can run WebAssembly code on their servers um, as a service for customers. So definitely check out Fastly CDN thing. They have a demo called Terrarium, um, which is actually using sort of CraneLift online. It's actually passed by, uh, by Fastly. So go check those out. Um, I guess one other example I can mention really quickly is, is uh, uh, the CraneLift SimpleJIT uh, demo. So if you, if you just search for SimpleJIT-demo um, in the CraneLift pro Crane Station project, um, you'll see the demo project. It's, a, it's actually a really simple toy language that we built that uses the Queen of Backend um, to compile a toy language and kind of show you the basics of using the, the SimpleJet API and the Queen of Builder APIs to build IR and, and, and generate them into code and run it. So those are some examples of use in the wild today. Very cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Dan. That was really informative. Uh, goodbye. Bye.